Senator Niall O'Donnell, please. To our contributors this morning as well. There's been a broad range of uh, fairly extensive legal questions, understandably, given the legal complexities of this uh, case and the challenge. Um, so I won't uh, rehearse uh, all of those. Um, just a couple of observations. I suppose the core political component of this is that there shouldn't be a dispute around this, um, and there shouldn't be a, a dispute mechanism sought because of the nature of the agreement. And for all of us, um, this may have been disputed beforehand, but ultimately it was agreed, and the British government were a co-garnitor and a co-signatory uh, to the agreement, and the agreement is explicitly clear uh, in terms of the right to not just identify, but to be accepted as Irish, uh, as British, uh, or as both. The other wee challenge for us, and the other wee consideration for us uh, in the Oireachtas, I think, is how this stance by the British government does not just run uh, up against, uh, very roughly up against the Good Friday Agreement, but always uh, also runs uh, up against Article 2 of Bunrock uh, in terms of our rights uh, to be uh, part uh, of the Irish nation. Um, so there is a consideration, I think, for us, and I think Deputy Bradnock makes a, a very valid suggestion in terms of that uh, cross-party motion. There is one on the Shannon Order paper, which your colleagues uh, and others uh, have signed, so it is maybe something that, that both houses can uh, uh, pursue uh, in equal measure uh, going forward. I am also encouraged that the Tanisha has agreed to meet uh, yeah, Emma finally um, later this month with myself uh, and a number of other uh, colleagues from uh, the North uh, as, as well. Um, I think one of the things that we could do, Chair, and if it's in order, is to suggest that this committee certainly writes to the British Secretary of State seeking an update on the review. Um, because my experience, along with uh, our visitors' experience here this morning, has been it's been like trying to grab smoke. Um, so I'm not suggesting that we will have any uh, additional success in that regard, but I do think it's worth uh, actioning uh, off the back uh, of today's uh, meeting uh, as well. The question I always like to ask, and it's, it's sort of been covered uh, uh, already, is, is to ask what, what we can do, what, what pressure we can bring to bear uh, on uh, the Irish government. I mean, the Irish government, to be fair to them, uh, have uh, said all of the right things in terms of upholding uh, uh, Emma's rights, in terms of they consider Emma uh, to be uh, an Irish citizen. Very good of them, 21 years after the Good Friday Agreement, but nevertheless, it's it's important that that's uh, said. So I'm just keen if maybe you could expand on what you've said to colleagues already around uh, the challenges uh, and the work for us uh, going forward, both as a mem as members of this committee, but also as individual members of the Oireachtas. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Senator. Um, there isn't a particular question. Well, it's really just the answer. The Irish government, I mean, I don't know, uh, are, are there other avenues open uh, to the Irish government outside of the dispute me mechanism that we know? Um, are there other avenues through existing uh, okay. institutions? Is there a concern in terms of its impact, how it impacts upon uh, Bunrock Meharan and Article 2 thereof uh, in terms of uh, this? And really what more the Irish government could do in terms of Colin reference the upcoming hopefully upcoming uh, referendum uh, on voting rights. But the Irish government keep consistently telling us that we're Irish citizens, but then there's actually no tangible action in terms of, of enfranchising uh, that citizenship. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, under, within the, the confines of the Good Friday Agreement, within the confines of the Constitution, are there tangible actions that the Irish government can take in the here and now and over the next short uh, to medium uh, term um, that would actually uh, tangibly enfranchise those of us who are Irish citizens resident in the north, beyond simply the holding of a passport. Got that. Okay. Emma, would you like to take that, please? I think that um, the absence of a, of a dispute mechanism in the Good Friday Agreement um, doesn't undermine or minimize the, the strength and the weight and the power that the Irish government does have when it comes to the agreement. They are co-guarantors, and I think that what's needed now is for um, a realization of that, um, that they, the, the Irish government does have that ability to take a stand um, in defense of this provision. I think that the, um, 
we need more political pressure for sure at this point. Um, and there's a lot of negotiations happening right now around the withdrawal agreement, around Brexit, around a lot of co conversations are happening. Um, I personally like to see this start to creep its way onto those papers and those negotiations and um, potentially, you know, some sort of political weight put behind that as to finding a way to find a resolution in order to safeguard our rights. Um, in terms of other avenues, I would turn to Colin and, and maybe he would have something more on that than me. <laughs> is, there, is there a page there you haven't <laughs> no, guessed, no, right. Colin? I think the first it's a great set of comments and questions is that what today is underlining is that Ireland made fundamental constitutional changes as a consequence of the agreement and the overriding concern I think at the moment is for reasons that are about the peculiar, peculiarity of the British constitutional legal system, the agreement hasn't found the home it needed to find within that system, and I think that needs to, to change. And if that means changing domestic law to reflect these things more effectively, then it needs to do that. I think I, I'm going to underline something uh, today that I've recently and I'm speaking in a personal capacity today to say this. So I've, I found myself in the public sphere recently in relation to a range of interventions myself, and some of which haven't been entirely pleasant. And somebody said to me uh, around some of that, well, you know, if there was an executive, you know, this stuff in, in the North. And it made me think about this evidence session today because I think that's actually an incredibly problematic narrative and it's suffocating political discourse on the island at the moment. The idea that the answer to all the problems in Northern Ireland rest in an executive and an assembly, because that's fundamentally wrong and isn't true. And I think it's creating a dangerous narrative and expectations around any power sharing administration that may return. Because the things that we're talking about today rest within the gift of both governments to show leadership to, to show, not tell, right? So this is a call today for both the British and Irish governments to show, not tell. The implementation gaps that we are identifying today primarily rest with either or both governments. So in the spirit of showing and not just telling, I think it's about time both governments worked harder as co-guarantors of that agreement to take these forward and make them meaningful. There are British-Irish negotiations ongoing around what's happening in terms of the power sharing administration. But perhaps most significantly in the time ahead, the EU-UK negotiations, to which Ireland has a very, very significant voice. We've seen the interventions from the US this week as well. So I wouldn't, I'm not somebody who overplays over legal remedies, as important as they are. There are also political negotiations upcoming on which pressure must be brought to bear on the British government to address the range of implementation gap, including in relation to M and Jake's case that we've outlined today. And as the negotiations around the withdrawal agreement and protocol as flawed and problematic as aspects of that are, they show there are ways to, to do this. So I think it's time for both governments really to, to step up in relation to the implementation gap that we've mentioned today. Yeah, um, I just like to say that the, the engagement and the, the stance taken by the Irish government, as Emma said, was incredibly helpful and, and very strong. Um, and I'll, we would like to see that continue and increase. And I suppose my my thought is that we can see clearly in this upper tribunal decision and in the Home Office arguments the stance that the UK government are taking, which is this idea that the citizenship provisions were never enacted because that was the clear intention of the drafters that there was no need and the British Nationality Act has always been in compliance with the Good Friday Agreement and I mean not not even touching into the fact that UK policy and practice doesn't following the Good Friday Agreement doesn't reflect that but the Irish government following the Good Friday Agreement made significant legislative change to enact the citizenship provisions and I suppose it would be good to see a strong stance coming from the Irish government on what the intention of the provisions were um, and on what 
coming back against that argument, you know, that they, they what's the phrasing? Um, it is inconceivable that this is what they intended. Um, if that's the stance the British government are going to make, I would like to see a, a strong stance against that from the Irish government, particularly in reflecting their own legislative actions. Um, and perhaps on a, on a smaller scale, but the Northern Irish Human Rights Commission's report, it would be good to see engagement with that. And the fresh calls for the Northern Irish Bill of Rights, that's really increasing, and it would be good to see the Irish government engage meaningfully with that as well. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Senator.